and Jessica is here with us. Jessica, just offer a prayer of thanksgiving for us, please. Let's pray. Almighty and merciful God, from whom comes all that is good, we praise you for your mercies, for your goodness that has created us, your grace that has sustained us, your discipline that has corrected us, your patience that has borne with us, and your love that has redeemed us. Help us to love you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sure, sure. 
I praise God for what he does for us. Mm -hmm. And I thank God for Wesley Biblical Seminary. I thank God for Dr. Nyhoff. I thank God for the staff. And um, I just want you to know, there will be times when some of you will have all you need. There will be times when some of you don't. God, your sustainer. Princeton WordNet Dictionary defines perfectionism as a disposition to feel that anything less than per perfect is unacceptable. So a perfectionist, then, is someone who is displeased by anything that does not meet very high standards. Perfectionism abounds. In the Wesleyan Holiness Movement, we talk about the beautiful message of perfect love. And sometimes when people hear the message of holiness and entire sanctification and the hope held out to live a victorious Christian life, we distort that beautiful message, that beautiful biblical truth, and we say something like this. Finally, a solution for my inability to be perfect. 
And some of us who have heard the message of Christian perfection, heard the Wesleyan holiness message, find ourselves hungry for what it offers, but then we layer on top of what the truth of the biblical message offers all of these expectations surrounding our own baggage. Perfectionism. You're staring at me. I've done it. And some of you have done it. We do something like instead of trusting God, even once we've entered into the blessing, even instead of trusting God for his continued cleansing and infilling, we resort to a kind of Wesleyan holiness coupled with our own effort and seem to think that if I can just do good enough, if I can be better, try harder, do better, I can be good enough for God. We resort to our own work because it seems so much more comfortable, so much more precise. So much more subjectively appealing. Maybe even so much more satisfying to our egos. God forbid. Faith is too frightening. It's too imprecise. If I can just be better. So we adopt a kind of religious perfectionism. That's based upon keeping a series of self-construed rules and rituals that we confuse and distort with living a life that pleases God. Paul wrote in, first, in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not lost. That pretty much describes the kind of perfectionistic bondage we create for ourselves. And Paul says, we are no wise. I think he described the problem of perfectionism exactly. This comparison to self-made standards, comparison to social norms within the fellowship of believers, ignoring God, ignoring his absolute standard, and even sometimes worse than ignoring it, distorting it into a caricature of what it really is. And all the while we find our, that our perfectionism leaves us empty and discouraged, and we find ourselves saying things like, this message of Christian perfection does not work. Are you all with me? And so in response to that, what do we do? Well, I will suggest to you tonight that God is inviting us to exchange our idolatrous version of worship called perfectionism for the beautiful standard of perfect love as taught to us in Holy Scripture. He wants to release us from the bondage of our own perfectionism into the realm of the spirit-filled life and perfect love for His glory. Our Scripture lesson, 1 John chapter 4, beginning with verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, he in us, because he has given us of his Holy Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. 
And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. May the Lord bless his holy word. Tonight I want to talk to you about perfectionism versus Perfectionism versus perfect love. God invites us to exchange our idol of perfectionism for the bountiful outpouring of the Spirit and perfect love in our hearts. I remember uh, a young man that I knew as a Bible college student. I was a young professor, and this young man was in bondage to doubt. He was in bondage to fear. He was in bondage to perfectionism. And sometimes he would become so discouraged in his faith and his uncertainty of his standing with regard to his faith experience before God that he would commit some blatant sin of disobedience. He would utter some outlandish profanity. Because now, at least, his doubts were removed and he knew that he grieved God the Holy Spirit and he needed to repent and be restored. It was a sick kind of spiritual experience. Then he'd repent of whatever known sin. He would lay hold of God in faith and walk with the Lord for a season. And then the cycle repeated itself until ultimately that sick, broken cycle drove him away from faith altogether. He was in bondage. He was in bondage to his own standard of perfection. Now, why do we become perfectionists? Why do we flee to that kind of position? Now, I don't, I don't intend to be uh, too psychological tonight, but I do think that there are some, some human and some social kinds of answers to some of that, along with the spiritual. Let's consider first the obvious one. Sometimes our homes and families life, family lives push us to a kind of Sometimes family atmospheres create standards of criticism, control, unrealistic expectations, and ridicule of anything less than the family-defined version of perfection, whatever that is. And then in our heads, voices from the past will echo. Frustrated perfectionists may grow up to reach for the extremes of giving up on even trying, or just trying all the harder, chasing after that elusive carrot on the stick always seems to be just out of reach. Perfectionism. It's never good enough. It's not perfect. That bondage. I remember talking to Bill at a camp meeting. We were fellow evangelists. He had been a student at Mount Carmel High School when, uh, and in the dorm room. My dad was a dorm supervisor. And he told me of how, based upon his family of origin, he was in incredible bondage to this kind of pressure of perfectionism. In his narrative, he credited the pressure he was under as a firstborn child.